because we're eager to hear from our panelists and to maximize question and answer time, uh, I'm only going to tell you the order and what the affiliations are of our speakers, and we've got really full bios in the program. Let me say, though, one other thing, that part of the intention of all of these symposia are that we don't finish conversations, and they're not supposed to be one-offs, but that they really become foundations and platforms, hopefully for networking and connections that all of you have here by being participants and, and audience members, but also that our hope is that we continue to then cultivate conversations and relationships with, uh, with, our, with our panelists as you and to and to work to help us here at the Divinity School and through the Religious Literacy Project think about how we can better um, collaborate around these larger questions. So I just want to say that explicitly to help um, minimize the frustration about the fact that we have so much rich literature and so little time for conversation. So I want to thank the per previous panel and really look forward to this to this conversation with our four experts. So Anthony Petro is an assistant professor in Bo at Boston University's Department of Religion and Women and Gender and Sexuality Studies program. Uh, Lorraine Ali is a television critic for the Los Angeles Times, and she has a pit bull named Sausage. <laughs> fair, fair warning. I'm, I'm keeping my poodle away from you. Uh, so, so Sarah Hammerschlag is an associate professor at the University of Chicago Divinity School in the fields of, get ready, I have to take a big breath here before I can finish this sentence, in all these fields of religion and literature, philosophy of religions, and the history of Judaism. We're only giving her 15 minutes too, not fair. All right, and Dr. Ron Manigold Bryant. Manigold Bryant is an associate professor of Africana Studies in, fac in a faculty affiliate uh, in, relig in religion at Williams College. And Ron is also, she navigates the academy as a scholar artist, which is really exciting, and teaches courses that um, merge her life as a musician and vocalist with her interdisciplinary specializations in religion, gender, race, music, popular culture with a focus on ethnographic methods. So I'm going to turn this right over to our panelists and thank you again, all of you, and look forward to your comments. Thank you so much. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here today and to hear from so many great presentations. I teach an introduction to religion class, and so I've been getting so much great material to share with my students, and so it's been great to think through different kinds of um, examples to take back to them. I'll definitely be drawing on some of Mick's work, especially um, Halal and the Families. Great. Um, so I wanted to organize my response today around one of the, the questions that the organizers put to us on this panel, which is, in what ways do media representations of religion limit what uh, audiences recognize as expressions of religion and who they identify as being legitimate adherents of a religion? And I'd like to think through this question through one of the archives that I work most with, which are the archives of feminist and queer history in the United States in the 1980s and the 1990s. And in thinking of the different frameworks that we've used to think about the relationships between religion and sexuality, and especially religion and queer or non-normative forms of sexuality, um, I can think of sort of two really powerful frameworks that have emerged out of the rhetoric of the culture wars since the 1970s, and that sort of set with us in our consumption of media, and especially entertainment media today. Um, one of the, 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 the very pervasive narratives is that, is that religion and sexuality are antithetical to one another, and all the more so if your sexuality is queer or non-normative in some way. And so we see a lot of narratives where one is discovering one's true sexuality, and that sexuality might be at odds with one's religious background, and so one leaves that religious background um, in order to express one's true form of sexuality. So they tend to be antithetical. Um, there are, are other ways in which this, this, this relationship between religion and sexuality play out in terms of what I think um, becomes visible and what is not visible in, in the way that we think about the history of religion and sexuality, and especially the religious expressions of queer people in the United States. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, in, 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 in more recent forms of, of entertainment media, we do see some complications of this narrative. So I wanted to offer one other framework that I've sort of noticed a good bit in recent forms of popular media, 
which are stories of coming to religion or coming back to religion, of sort of overcoming that tension. And we see these in a variety of shows. So Transparent is one great example where the, the main character, Mora, sort of um, moves through her transition alongside this renewal of her own Jewish faith. So there's this episode where her daughter, Ali, is sort of going through an identity crisis because she never had a bat mitzvah and trying to figure out what that means. And at the same time, Mora um, puts on a star of David and sort of is recognizing what it means to become a woman in relationship to um, moving back towards her own Jewish expressions of faith. Um, another would be uh, the, 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 the remake of the show Queer Eye. So the second season, we were talking with Ron about this last night a bit. The second season starts with this episode where the Fab Five, or these five queer men um, who, who do makeovers, uh, and, and they meet an older black woman in, 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 in gay Georgia, and, and, and the episode focuses around um, one of the men from the Fab Five coming to terms with his own experience with the Christian church and how difficult it is for him to enter the church because he felt ostracized as a gay man. And the person who they're making over about her own relationship um, with her own son who came out as gay and they had been estranged for a while. And, and they, of course, it ends with the Fab Five guy going into the church and it ends with a reconciliation with her son. So it winds up being a story of good religion in the end. Um, so um, I want to open up these narratives a little bit by thinking about other ways that we might look at the way feminist and queer people especially have drawn upon different religious forms of iconography and ritual in their work, sometimes that open it up in perhaps unorthodox or, or more subversive ways, especially when they're bringing politics to the table. Um, so they don't necessarily deliver us at examples of good religion, but they deliver us at more ambivalent relationships to religion. So I'll explain a bit more what I mean. And I wanted to start with a story. So I was in New York City this summer doing several weeks of archival research in the, the archives of David Wojnarowicz, who is an artist and, and filmmaker who lived um, in New York City, um, who, who, who was working as an artist in the 70s and the 1980s, became very famous as part of the East Village art scene. Um, he died in 1992 of complications from AIDS. And uh, I, I was working in this archive at NYU, and there was someone else in the archive at the same time. We were, we were sort of like wrestling over boxes. We were trying to use you know, the same materials. And, and at some point, it became ridiculous that we hadn't talked to another. So we started talking, and, and I found out that they were doing research on Warner Robich's work around nature and environmentalism, and I was doing work on religion. And um, we were talking about this as we lined up to go into an exhibition. So the Whitney um, uh, had a retrospective of Warner Robich's work that opened um, this summer, July 13th, that closes September 30th. So in the, if you're in the New York area, go and check it out. And as we're standing in the line to, to go in and see the Warner Robich exhibition, History Keeps Me Awake at Night, we were talking a little bit more. And, and, um, and, and, and this person who I met there kind of was sort of expressing surprise that I was interested in religion and David Wojnarowicz, who is this queer artist. He, 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 he produced um, uh, a lot of different kinds of media, uh, but it didn't make sense. Um, they thought that I'd be focusing on religion. Like, what, what is there? And then I said, I said, oh, well, you know, he got in trouble in some of his early work. He, uh, it, it was sort of clipped by Donald Wildman, who is one of the, the who, who was the founder of the American Family Association, a sort of religious right leader um, in the 70s and in the, in the 1980s. And, and it sort of sent around some of Wojnarowicz's work as examples of uh, blasphemy and mm -hmm. pornography. Wojnarowicz winds up suing Donald Wildman in 1990 um, for misusing, misappropriating his work uh, in the state of New York. And he actually wins the case and is awarded like a dollar. Um, uh, uh, but then Donald Wildman had to mail out this, this retraction saying that I misrepresented Wojnarowicz's work as being pornographic or sacrilegious in various ways. Um, so, so, so I was talking about this and I said, oh yeah, 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 of course he's very anti-religious. And I said, well, it's actually more complicated than that. If you look through Wojnarowicz's work, um, the things he's doing with religion can't necessarily be slotted on the side of anti-religion or as sacrilegious. And um, what I was trying to work through here is how even as we're faced with his work, even as we've both been working through this archive that I see is replete with religious references in all complicated kinds of ways, um, even if it, as it's before us, it's really hard to see a queer artistic figure as anything other than anti-religious or sacrilegious, even when it's in front of us. Um, so Wojnarowicz sort of 
if you haven't heard of him from the current exhibit, it's been, it's been picked up in the New York Times and in other venues. Um, he was also the site of controversy in 2010 when a, 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 his short film, Fire in My Belly, was going to be included as part of the Hide Seek exhibit at the Smithsonian. And at that time, it raised controversy once again when um, Bill Donahue of the Catholic League uh, saw one of the images that was included um, in Fire in My Belly. It's an image of, of the crucifix, of the crucifix um, with ants crawling over it. And, and, and charged that this was anti-Catholic hate speech. And, and, and in light of that charge and worried about the kind of attention that this would draw, especially given the history of controversies around arts funding at the federal level, the Smithsonian pulled Vornarovich's um, short film. Uh, 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 now, of course, because of, of the provocative nature of, of pulling the film, the kind of news that, it, it, that, that, that or that the way that that enters into the news cycle, the film actually went viral on YouTube for a while in 2010. So a lot more people probably saw it than they would have otherwise. Um, and I wanted to play just the first r roughly 35 seconds of the film to give you a sense for the medium in which Wojnarowicz is working with his filmic work. We talked in the first panel a good bit about narrative. Um, Wojnarowicz is not known for narrative film. He's known rather for the creation of these very complicated mythical systems in which he's trying to operate and, 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 and through which he's trying to think through um, his experience. So let me just play. Stop there. But in, in the in the parts of the clip that I played, and, and the, the version that they used at the, at the Smithsonian was, was a four-minute version of this clip. Um, Wojnarowicz himself had produced a, a, an 11-minute version and a seven-minute version. A lot of this is raw footage that he was still working with in his lifetime and never had a chance to complete himself before he died. But in it, when, when, when you don't just isolate a single image but see it in, 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 in at least a little bit of the context of the film, you see some of the other images against which it's placed, including um, the suturing back together of the broken bread and including the, the uh, um, drops of blood into the dish. And I, I just wanted to, to use that to open up a little bit about how we read images. You talked about disseminating various kinds of images through social media, but we don't always talk as much about how we read images, about interpretation and the demands that we ought to place on ourselves and our, and, and our students and our audiences for having better ways of interpreting images, right? So um, on the one hand, you could look at an image of the of the cross with ants and immediately think, oh, this is sacrilegious, this is make, making fun of religion. And I don't want to foreclose those kinds of interpretations. Uh, I, 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 art as a form is not one that offers us a very clear descriptive account of what it's doing. Um, but if you place this crucifix against the context of the other images in the film, including the suturing together of the broken bread, which in, which in Catholic tradition represents the body of Christ, and against the idea of, of the drops of blood, again, sort of invoking the idea of incarnationality. Um, also, ants in other work by Vunarovic often represent um, mindless human society, sort of trudging and doing its thing and running roughshod over all sorts of things. So another way of interpreting this image is the ants are representing the way that people sort of run roughshod over um, the suffering Christ and don't even realize that Christ is there, right? So I just wanted to, to mention this, to open up um, a kind of hermeneutics for how we might understand the way that a queer artist like Vunarovic is using these images. And I wanted to offer one other example. This is an image of Bray Navarro, who is a Chicano, who, who was a Chicano AIDS activist, artist, and also a filmmaker who was active once again in New York City in the 1980s at the height of, of, of the AIDS crisis in the city in particular. And he was involved with um, an AIDS activist group called Act Up New York. And within that group, he was involved with, with, with um, a collective called Diva TV. I, I have just an image of their logo. And they took it upon themselves to produce grassroots video responses to what they saw as 
um, the difficulty of gaining access to mainstream media coverage at the time. They sort of knew that their work, that AIDS was not going to be covered in the ways that they wanted it to be covered in mainstream news media. And so they saw their work as a way of witnessing and testifying to the work that activists were doing and what was going on on the ground. Now, this image of Winnie Robich um, is, 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 it, it was taken in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City where ACT UP staged um, a massive AIDS protest in December of 1989 called Stop the Church. They also, Diva TV, produced um, footage from that demonstration that they made into a documentary called Like a Prayer that features a number of these clips of, of Ray Navarro dressed up as Jesus in a sort of Jesus drag. Um, it also includes a number of Catholics and, F and, 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 and ex Catholics who identify as gay talking about their experiences with the Catholic Church. The documentary itself was produced for other members of this community, so they never intended it to have a wide distribution. Rather, it was made and viewed in bars and at homes as a way of thinking about their own community and their ethical responses. Once again, I wanted to play just a little bit of a clip. This footage is Diva TV footage, but it was actually used in a more recent documentary called How to Survive a Plague that came out in 2012 um, by David France. And some of this footage also has surfaced in other kinds of aid, AIDS documentaries that have been made more recently. Um, another one that you might know is, is Jim Hubbard and Sarah Schulman's United in Anger, which also uses some of the footage of Wojnarowicz. So I just wanted to play a little bit so you can see what Navarro is up to here. This is Jesus Christ. I'm in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral on Sunday. We're here reporting on a major AIDS activist and abortion rights activist demonstration, which will be taking place here all morning. Inside, Cardinal O'Connor is busy spreading his lies and rumors about the position of lesbians and gays. We're here to say we want to go to heaven too. Make sure your second coming is a safe one. Use condoms. All right, now, one can certainly understand why somebody might find this to be offensive in various ways. It's, right, it's taking on the icon of Jesus and, and seemingly mixing Jesus with something as profane as sex and, 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 and gay sex at that. Now, there are other ways of reading what's going on here. Uh, um, in some of my writing, I tried to do a reading of, of Ray Navarro's particular form of Jesus drag, which I argue on the one hand is actually drawing from a common visual vocabulary for thinking about Jesus. It, it is invoking Warner Solomon's famous head of Christ image of Jesus as having this soft, glowing hair. It's, it's beautifully lit, it's golden, it's soft, it's sweet. Um, it, it's a very feminine form of Jesus. He's also pulling from, I would argue, uh, 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 a Mexican-American Catholic popular devotional style where it's very common to inhabit and to perform Christ through performances, elaborate performances of the Stations of the Cross, where actually inhabiting these characters is part of the annual devotional practices of a community. Obviously, here he's laying, he's, he's uh, overlaying that through queer forms of, of drag that are playful, that are useful. I, I would argue that it's, it's often difficult to, to understand what it means to be respectful to religion because we often reduce the idea of being respectful to religion to being very serious in, in a grave sense about what that might mean. And introducing humor into that equation is not something that we're used to, as Mick sort of talked about. Um, but here we see Navarro drawing on humor and this really intimate traditions within a grassroots community to make sense of the experience of Jesus Christ that really pushes our analytic and, and interpretive vocabulary to think about how it is that people employ religious imagery, even in ways that, 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 that don't fit into the binary frameworks that we're used to working with. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for having me here. And um, I have the title of television critic at the Los Angeles Times, but I'm in fact um, have been covering kind of culture and media and kind of by default, um, the Muslim in Arab America, particularly after 9-11. My background, I'm half Iraqi. I am Muslim, not practicing, but um, in covering media, in covering film, in covering TV, I often notice there, you know, if there's a Muslim portrayed, they're praying five times a day, they're like super devout, and it makes me feel like a bad Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> 
but that also the ones often in the media are doing bad things, so therefore I'm one of the good ones. Um, mm -hmm. But I just want to start out by saying, you know, something that Joanna had pointed out earlier in the conference today is that, uh, it, I might slaughter these numbers, but most of those that they polled, 45% said they understood Islam or Muslims through what they saw in the media, um, or I'm assuming in popular culture, which is really disturbing given, you know, what I see covering it. So I wanted to just read you a piece that I wrote, um, right, I think it was right as Trump was still campaigning, and he was using a lot of like the Muslim fear as leverage, and why that was so easy for him to leverage. So long before Donald Trump campaigned on the promise of banning Muslims from entering the US or creating a registry for those who already live here, there was a master fearmonger who made the president-elect's divisive rhetoric seem like child's play. It capitalized upon the terror of 9-11 by portraying most Muslims, even those who are American, as terrorists it cast a suspicious eye toward anyone who looked remotely like Salah from, later, from Raiders of the Lost Ark, and pretty much ensured that Westerners would know Islam through only the prism of suicide bombings, religious extremism, and oppressed women in burqas. And nobody knows the difference between a burqa and a hijab, and Hollywood's so frustrating. <laughs> Nikah. Um, when it comes to exploiting the fear of the other for personal gain, the far right has nothing on liberal Hollywood. Television producers, writers, actors, and network execs, many of whom have openly criticized ultra-conservative politicians for their intolerant views, have done more to popularize Islamophobia over the past 15 years than all of Trump's campaign proclamations. There has never been liberal Hollywood when it comes to the portrayal of Muslims on TV, says professor and author Jack Shaheen, God bless his soul who's been researching this subject since the mid-1970s. They've reinforced the idea that many Americans now have that all Muslims are terrorists. They knew they would get away with it because there's no one that's going to protest. They've been planting it, and in doing so, they've been getting the ratings. That, di that dynamic grew exponentially following the 9-11 attacks. While President George W. Bush deliver, delivered dozens of speeches about how ours was not a war against Islam, but a campaign against evil, network television was busy putting the finishing touches on, a on the series that came to embody TV's narrative about the war against evil Islam. Eight weeks after the attacks, Fox released 24, <laughs> a series steeped in scheming swarthy Muslims and the heroic efforts of a very non-swarthy Jack Bauer, Kiefer Sutherland. The series outlasted both Bush terms and spawned an army of like-minded shows. The next phase in television terrorism drama included Showtime's Sleeper Cell, which arrived with the tagline, friends, neighbors, husbands, terrorists, and Homeland, where the mere act of a man praying towards Mecca signaled foreboding events, which I just want to stop there. If you kind of look at the, the times when Hollywood and television has portrayed Muslims praying, nine times out of 10, there'll be this spooky music in the background, like, oh, here we go, here's this really scary, something bad's gonna happen. So, <clears throat> um, and with a title like Tyrant, it was clear that FX's drama about an American Arab family was no Cosby show. Even network TV's good Muslims, like Saeed on Lost, or twins Naima and Raina of Rana, sorry, Rana of Quantico are defined by a connection to Saddam's Republican Guard or terror groups. It's like the LGBT community 30 years ago, said Sue Abidi, director of the civil rights advocacy group, MPAC. Every time there was a gay character on TV or in film, the storyline would be about AIDS. Almost all Muslim storylines up to now are connected to terror. Even if they end up being a good person, it's often discovered under a cloud of suspicion. There's no doubt that homegrown terror attacks in the US, from San Bernardino to Orlando, have helped bolster arguments that art is only reflecting reality. But as University of North Carolina professor Charles Perlsman and David Schnauz, I'm going to mispronounce that, um, I'm going to swift over their quote. Television of late has been trying to adjust to a changing world by developing more diverse narratives and investing in more projects by creators and writers of color including Shonda Rhimes' Scandal 
Kenyabaris, Blackish. But despite the number of shows that have Islamic terror elements in their plots, from Madam Secretary to CSI, Muslims behind the camera are still rare. The lack of representation was glaringly evident in the fifth season of Homeland, when graffiti that read, Homeland is racist in Arabic, made it into a scene. Yeah. <laughs> it was such a beautiful moment. I was like, really? You, just, you didn't see that? <laughs> Artists hired to decorate the wall of the, fictional, of the fictional Syrian refugee camp slipped the words in, and there was no one else on set with enough knowledge of the Arab world to catch their subversive message. <laughs> Sometimes that ignorance works in, in fun ways. <laughs> um, characters who arrived during the seemingly endless presidential campaign of the last year and a half have definitely signaled a shift. In HBO's critically lauded The Night Of, we met Nasir Khan, played by Riz Ahmed, an average college student accused of a crime that had nothing to do with terrorism. His journey through the legal system highlighted an institutional prejudice. Aziz Ansari's Netflix series Master of None depicts him as strug a struggling actor who finds himself in all sorts of painfully normal situations, bad dates, flub job interviews, disappointing his immigrant parents, situations far too commonplace for TV's Muslims before him. If we don't do it, who else is going to do it? And sorry, said to me. Yet in an unforeseen twist, Trump's election has potentially accelerated the interest in more nuanced storylines involving actors like Ansari. Right after the election, I'm talking the day or two after, we had people in the industry reach out to us. The USA Network, Amazon, Hulu, a major network, says civil rights advocate Obidi. They have directives from their networks to watch for Islamophobic tones. Not that the studios were giving directi directives for Islamic stories, Islamophobic storylines before, but now they're saying, we need consultants because our studio wants to be careful. The recent presidential election is such an extraordinary moment in American history, says Islam. And there's a new drive among the network and studio executives he's met with to create narratives, to create counter narratives to Trump's. And this is um, Reza Islam, sorry. They want to make a statement about American ideals and people who make this country what it is, whether that's focusing on minority groups, African Americans, Muslims, Jews, or whether it's simply presenting a different side of the American story. But I can say with absolute confidence the industry has been galvanized around this election. And whether you believe it or not, television is the front line of shaping public perception, even when it comes to depicting the oh-so-mysterious Muslim. So, I have always believed that um, pop culture is at the forefront of uh, influencing public opinion and also media. But I have to say, I didn't expect that I would be writing pieces like this when I got into you know, criticism, um, writing about entertainment. I, I came into this as a music critic, writing about Nirvana, Jay-Z. Um, you know, and I've got to interview them, which is really exciting too. But you know, I, I didn't expect to be doing this. And I think once I... Um, you know, when I was growing up, people, my father's from Iraq, uh, people didn't even know Baghdad was a real place. It was the, it was the funny place on I Dream a Genie that they talked about. Um, and I think ideas about, people didn't even know what Muslims were. Ideas about the Middle East or Arabs were, you know, Lawrence of Arabia, beautiful, even farther back, Rudolf Valentino, that, that kind of thing, the chic. Um, but then, you know, moving forward, that started changing by what we were seeing in the news, whether it was uh, the 67 war, whether it was the Iranian revolution. So you started to see those kind of narrative shift um, in films and in TV. So by the time I got to Newsweek, they hired me as a music critic in 2000. 9-11 um, happens, and I start to see, and I'm in those planning meetings listening to how they're going how they're covering this. And I'm writing about entertainment, and I'm listening to the people who are going to be covering the actual attacks. And I just heard so much misinformation about Islam, about the Arab world. And it wasn't intentional, but it was ignorance. It was the same kind of ignorance that was, you know, we don't know where Baghdad is. Well, people know where Baghdad is now because, you know, we've attacked it, or we're going to attack it. And we've already had, you know, the war in Iraq. So once, um, I think, I, I started writing pieces about um, the attacks against Arab Americans and Muslims following 9-11. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to counter this narrative of 
that we always seem to have of like, how do we combat Islam? How do we combat? And it's like, well, wait a minute. Okay, back up. Because a lot of Muslims are American. I mean, it sounds really basic, but that wasn't there. So I started doing that. But after, um, when we were kind of beating the drum about invading Baghdad, those meetings in particular at Newsweek were really disturbing because they were, you know, the foreign editors and the top editors were talking about how this was going to, in, in strategic terms, we're going to hit the port city, of, you know, fill in the blanks. It was all just, you know, we're going to hit these areas in Baghdad. And they were talking about how, how the Iraqis were such tribal people. And they didn't know the difference between Sunni and Shia. Um, and so I decided, OK, I'm going to write about this from the uh, perspective of my family, who lived in Baghdad at the time, half of whom lived in Baghdad. And instead of talking about how strategically we're going to go into Baghdad, I talked about my uncle. How will he get out? How will he move around? He's bound in a wheelchair. I talked about the bakery down the street from the house. You know, will that still be there? Will that still be open? Will they still be able to, you know, eat essentially when all this happens? I'll try to make this quick. Um, so the feedback I got from readers was different than anything I had ever seen. Um, before that, occasionally I would get like a hate letter for my last name, but you know nothing. After that, I was braced. I was like, okay, there's a lot of anti-Muslim sentiment. No, it was, oh my gosh, you know, how is your family? How is uh, Afra? How is, I mean, literally using the names I used in there. And I thought, oh my God, you know, they actually, uh, among all this coverage we did, that resonated, the human beings. So I think moving forward, you know, I decided there, I don't really have a choice in a way. Well, I do. You could either just not write about it at all and, and implode or do what you can. And um, I think as one of the few at, at the time, you know, Muslim American journalists, I felt it's, I have to do this. So moving forward, I have tried um, to sort of uh, write about like what I just read you, but as I'm seeing shows, uh, okay, got it, three minutes. Okay, I'll go quickly. Okay, so anyway, stuff starts to proliferate, bad stuff, but then I would say, what I just read there, in terms of Trump and all this stuff ratcheting up, and even before that, Obama's a secret Muslim, don't vote for him. Mm -hmm. You started seeing narratives come out that were more nuanced in Hollywood. And um, you can see it, like I mentioned, in, you know, particularly in, in TV on the night of, Aziz Ansari's Master of None is great. If you have not watched it, watch it. It's really good. But I just wanted to uh, read you one other thing that I wrote, and it will, I think it will only be two minutes long. Um, because it's, it was a way that my, I covered the travel ban because my, um, I'll just read this to you. Okay. Abdullah missed Metallica by two days when he left for Amman, Jordan, to get his student visa renewed. My nephew, or at least that's what I call the 19-year-old son of my cousin, debated before he left California in December about whether to stay the extra couple days in Los Angeles to see his favorite metal band. Galek told him, go take care of the visa and we'll figure out a way uh, to get you to see Metallica when you return. The promise became far more complicated after President Trump signed an executive order on Friday that bars citizens of seven Muslim majority countries from entering the US, even if they've already been vetted and have a valid visa as Abdullah has. For how long is anyone's guess as the details of this order seem to change by the hour and source? Is it 30 days, 90, is it 120, indefinitely? I have all my papers in order and I got the visa so I should be fine, Abdullah first texted from Amman on Saturday, where his parents and siblings live. But that was before he started seeing news stories surfacing online of green card and visa holders from the countries on Trump's list, list being detained and possibly deported from airports. Abdullah may have an Iraqi passport, but he barely remembers the place where his parents, grandparents, and extended family had always called home up until the U.S. invaded Baghdad in 2003, and it became so dangerously destabilized they had to flee. They've lived in Jordan ever since, where Abdullah became a classic rock buff, took up drums, studied some engineering, learned English, complete with American slang, dude, and got hooked on Game of Thrones. We did everything we were supposed to do, Abdullah's, cousin, Abdullah's mom, my cousin Zainab, texted. We should be okay, shouldn't we? We figured out his visa. 
One of the last things Abdullah did before did with my family before he left for Jordan was attend a Christmas Carol production at the Glendale Center Theater. When my mom leaned over to explain it was based on a book by Charles Dickens, Abdullah nodded in recognition and said, yeah, I love the ghost of Christmas present, but Jacob Marley kind of freaks me out. <laughs> The executive order likely blocking Abdullah's return is, according to Trump, about protecting the U.S. from foreign threats, despite the fact that none of the terror attacks on U.S. soil has been perpetrated by nationals from those countries, let alone anyone who came here as a refugee. And if the cheesecake factory-loving, converse-wearing, Marvel movie aficionado Abdullah is a fanatic of anything, it's American pop culture. When we went to Coachella together last year, we went to Coachella together last year. It was the first music festival and one of the first concerts he'd ever attended. He sang every lyric to Guns N' Roses song, though almost all were written before he was born. He danced to Major Lazer. He bought vinyl LPs because he said it's old school. <laughs> Trump, who played You Can't Always Get What You Want before his victory speech on election night, <laughs> would surely find common ground with Abdullah there. He's perhaps one of the only millennials around who finds the Rolling Stones, who still finds the Rolling Stones lyrics subversive. <laughs> Call it a Muslim ban or an executive order. Either way, Trump's travel restrictions have at least temporarily severed a kid's dream of studying in the U.S. and seeing Metallica or the Rolling Stones. I'm trying to skip to the end here. Um, okay, uh, but as an Iraqi, he should. It all seemed suspended in a state of limbo when he was stuck over there. But as an Iraqi, he should be used to this. When millions fled following the US invasion and the chaos that followed, they went to places like Syria and Jordan to wait out the war. When it became clear that Iraq was increasingly unlivable, they applied for asylum in the US and Europe, and they waited more. I, this is too long. But anyway, you get the, you get the idea. So this is how I sort of um, tackled some of these things, just from a personal perspective from a human perspective, and um, that's it. This is a little disorganized, but there you go. <laughs> I apologize for my title. I'm cringing towards my own title. Um, first, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, as you might see from my bio, this is a little bit out of my expertise, but I spend most of my time thinking about how Jews are represented most often in literature and philosophy, which means I spend a lot of time watching TV thinking about how they're represented. But uh, TV, in some sense, has actually become such a private experience that I don't even get to talk about it with my husband because he doesn't watch the same shows. So it's really <laughs> exciting to get to talk about it with some other people. I'm also going to apologize for my stodginess. I'm going to read because that's what I'm used to doing. Um, Given that Jews are only 2% of the American population, it's probably a given that representing Jews on television or in films inevitably means representing Jews to others. But this is not unique into the visual media. The very notion of the Jew as a figure to be represented, whether in literature, philosophy, religious texts, or on the screen, always involves the gaze of the other. As Cynthia Baker notes in her recent book, Jew, those who identified as Jews have not in fact owned the word Jew or controlled the discourse about it or even much used the term for most of the, 2000, for most of the past 2,000 years. Instead, as she points out, going back to Augustine, it has been the means by which Christianity defines its mirror opposite, its other. However, in the 20th century, there was a profound shift, one made possible by the emancipation of the Jews in the 18th and 19th century, and then by the aftermath of World War II, but evident already in the work of Franz Kafka and Sigmund Freud, and cemented by their post-war reception among writers and philosophers. The Jew didn't cease to be the mere opposite of its other, but it gained an additional, an additional balance or value as a figure. The Jew became exemplary of the human, of human alienation, the human id or desire, as a victim of an inscrutable world order. In the post-war French context, which is where my expertise is, Jean-Paul Sartre described the Jew and anti-Semite and Jew as the stranger, the intruder, the unassimilated at the heart of our society, but fundamentally like the rest of us, except overdetermined. The philosopher Vladimir Jankalevich puts it this way. Um, Every man is other than himself and is only a man by virtue of this possibility. But the Jew is two times absent from himself. And by virtue of this, we could say he is man par excellence. In other words, the figure of the Jew gives to others an exaggerated representation of the very condition of human life and modernity, allowing for the experience both of distance and identification. In the American context, it's more often been writers and comedians making claims about the nature of the Jews rather than philosophers. Lenny Bruce, 
<coughs> divided the world, divided uh, culture into all things Goyish and Jewish. Among the things Jewish in this famous monologue, Count Basie, titties, mouths, and Italians. Jewishness here refers to a proper culture and to something beyond it. It's a way of being in the world with which others can identify. And I mean, how many people say that they're honorary Jews? I don't know if people say that about other ethnicities or religions. Um, by virtue of something being labeled Jewish, whether a, juke, whether a joke or a character in a story, that which is threatening or challenging in it can be put at one remove, relegated to the Jew's difference or foreignness. The Jew has also become a figure for overwhelming affect, desire, sexuality, embodiment. The carnality of this trope can be traced all the way back to the spirit and letter distinction in Paul's letters, and there's evidence for it in the blood libel, and we see it spelled out very clearly in the, in the reception of Freud's quote-unquote Jewish science. But in the American context, Philip Roth's Portnoy's complaint did heavy duty to cement the association between the Freudian id and Jewishness in the American imagination. But Roth himself was preceded by the development of stand-up comedy as a Jewish art, brought from the Catskills out of the broader public. <clears throat> Here, too, the appeal of the carnal Jew is the simultaneous form of identification and distance that it provides. The Jew is other than me, but also an intensification of the human, providing a lens through which the viewer can see him or herself and yet at the same time disidentify. Now, I'm no expert on the nature of comedy, but I will say that I think this combination of having something recognizable, recognizable voiced but that one removed is, is exactly what has made stand-up comedy at its beginnings a distinctly Jewish cottage industry. So I've spoken about the figure of the Jew thus far only in terms of its resonance for a non-Jewish audience. But of course, there's always a Jewish audience as well. And this is actually what I want to talk about. That is to say, I'm interested in the way in which some recent representations of Jews in television and on screen navigate between these two functions, presenting the Jewish character as, or conflict to the non-Jewish audience as a kind of overdetermined version of the human condition. And at the same time, these words also speak to a Jewish audience, producing representations in which the Jewish viewer recognizes him or herself and laughs for a different reason, because we're in on the joke and recognize that it's a bit of a secret. Now, this dynamic of doubling is probably true for any representation of a minority that also aims at a larger audience, and I don't want to suggest that it makes the case of Judaism in the media exceptional. In every case, not, no doubt, not only the Jewish case, along with this dynamic comes fear. But it's a fear that Jewish writers have often exploited rather than shying away from, I and mean, we saw that in the Sarah Silverman thing, and it's encapsulated by that question asked in every Jewish neighborhood of every piece of news, large or small, local or national, is it good for the Jews? No doubt this question is endemic to the life of every minority community. However, there's a certain additional anxiety, I think, that comes with asking these questions about media representations of Jews tied to the perception that Jews are both invisible and pervasive. As we know, despite their small numbers, those are always exaggerated when you actually survey how many people, what, the, what people think the population of Jews is in actuality. There's an operating assumption among Jews and non-Jews alike that Jews can be invisible, can pass when necessary. Consequently, every representation is also something of an exposure. It's their capacity to blend in, perhaps, which also accounts for the perception that Jews represent the human, but intensified. There's something in the propensity for Jews in the last 75 years or so to represent both the other and this intensification of the human that has made Jewish writers and comedians successful to the very extent that they make us cringe. Not just viewer, Jewish viewers, but all viewers. If most of us cringe as, as Larry, David, Larry David when he says something insensitive or inappropriate or feel shocked and uncomfortable in the front of the sloppy sexual, sexual desire of Alex Portnor, there is an additional feeling of shame or discomfort for Jews themselves before these representations insofar as they exploit the very stereotypes of the Jews that are, we are always attempting to belie. At certain moments, these portrayals have thus incited the reaction of Jewish community leaders who find the exposure itself to be something of a betrayal. In 1962, Philip Roth was invited to a panel at Yeshiva University a couple years after the publication of Goodbye Columbus, at which he was asked if he would have written the same stories had he lived in Nazi Germany. Philip Roth, they seem to be saying, not good for the Jews. Seven years later, Gershom Scholem went so far as to say of Portnoy's complaint that it was a book for which the anti-Semites had been praying. But Portnoy was also written to incite exactly this reaction, to take vengeance on his upbringing in a Jewish home. As Scholem, said, as Scholem had said, no doubt, there are moments in the book which are clearly there only for a Jewish audience. They are both to trigger the ache of recognition and to exacerbate their anxiety. 
A chapter entitled Cunt Crazy begins with Alex Portnoy discussing masturbating on the 107 bus, follows with an excoriating discussion of kosher laws as the source of Jewish repression, and then describes God as sitting down on Yom Kippur fuming, quote, with a smashing miserable headache like my father at the height of his constipation. <laughs> To, to transcribe names into the Book of Life. This is a passage clearly meant to infuriate the rabbis. <laughs> Over the years, this performance of Jewish artists taunting the Jewish audience has itself become a trope. In the closing credits of A Serious Man, the writer and directors Joel and Ethan Cohen include a disclaimer, no Jews were harmed in the making of this film. <laughs> a Serious Man is a fascinating film to consider for our topic today. Let me talk about it briefly, and then I'll finish up with two more recent cases, Transparent and The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, yeah. which I would suggest deal with this phenomenon of double gaze through actually opposing strategies. A Serious Man is the Coen Brothers' 2009 film, which they themselves refer to as their Jewish movie. The film opens with a preface set in a shtetl in the Pale of Settlement about the visitation of a die book, which actually in the credits they put a question mark next to it because you never actually know. But the preface is never connected with the film except by its theme. The remainder is set in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, where the Coen brothers grew up, and manages to be simultaneously hyper-realist and fantastical. It is a Jobian narrative about a math professor, Larry Gopnik, who tries to do right, but finds himself punished and beset at every turn. The film even concludes with a Jobian whirlwind, or in this case, a tornado. In many ways, the Jewishness of the film itself feels overdetermined. As disasters befall Larry, he seeks advice from a series of three rabbis asking what God wants of him. But the rabbis caricatured, <clears throat> are caricatured as inscrutable and clueless, each in his own way, are straight out of a Jewish joke. Like Job, Larry loses his wife and his home, his dignity. Just at the end, when it seems as if he might get it back, that is to say he learns from his department chair that he's been granted tenure, he gets a call from his doctor asking him to come in immediately. And this scene, oscillating with that of the tornado headed toward his son in the header parking lot, um, to the sound of Jefferson Airplane singing, Somebody to Love, is where the film ends. The film was nominated for Best Picture at the Academy Awards 2010, but was maligned by a number of Jewish critics and some rabbis who saw it as the dangerous product of self-hating Jews, and worried, of course, about the light in which it cast Judaism. The film, like so many of the Coen Brothers movies, is designed to make us cringe and then laugh because we're cringing so much. As I discovered in the screening of the film with a mixed audience, the film does it, however, in very different ways for Jewish and non-Jewish audiences. In its hyper-realism, it includes references and images that only American Jews growing up in the 60s and 70s could possibly recognize. <coughs> Things like the tzedakah box on the desk of one of the rabbis, the rote repeated conjugation of the Hebrew word halak by the Hebrew teacher of Larry's son Danny, and the aesthetics of this 1967 bar mitzvah shot in the modernist synagogue of St. Louis Park. I think I put that, sorry, that's that one. Um, the film is in many ways a representation of the fears intrinsic to modern Judaism, both of an inscrutable divine justice and of being a minority watched from the outside. Larry's next door neighbors are menacing goyim, who play catch and go hunting, and at one point, Larry dreams that he and his brother are their prey. But the Cohen brothers have done something very interesting with their double audience, for they have simultaneously represented this fear through Larry's perspective and replicated it in their audience by creating a movie that reproduces common modern caricatures of Jews, replete with the nebbishy protagonist, dominating wife, licentious female neighbor, and conniving underhanded rival. The licentious female neighbor, by the way, is the same actress who plays Sarah in Transparent, which is interesting. Mm. All this for a mixed audience. In the discussion I attended following the screening, non-Jewish members were sure that the film had captured certain theological truths about the nature of Jewish theodicy, while Jewish members described squirming in their seats as they watched, both because of what they recognized and the discomfort that came from others watching. This anxiety was replicated in the reviews. David Denby wrote, as a piece of movie-making craft, a serious man is fascinating. In every other way, it's intolerable. One Jewish review called it defamation, complaining that the disclaimer that no Jews were injured in the making of the movie was the movie's biggest falsehood. <laughs> of course, the film's irony is best produced in and through such responses, as the disclaimer is the movie's best indication that its filmmakers set out to produce exactly the reaction they got. Now, in television, some of the anxiety of exposure is mitigated by the privacy of our viewing experience. At least one isn't conscious of the goy sitting next to you. 
But double viewing experience is nonetheless equally at stake insofar as the producers must surely be hoping for more than a 2% share of the viewing audience. Two of the most recent shows that have tackled this dynamic are Transparent and The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, both on Amazon and both to considerable critical acclaim. Transparent, which follows the Pfeffermans, a contemporary Jewish family in Los Angeles, as one of the parents, Morty Pfefferman, transitions to become Mora, is perhaps more explicitly about sexuality than it is about Judaism. And yet in the four years since its debut, there has, there, have, there, have been almost, there has been almost as much attention paid to its portrayal of Judaism as to its treatment of gender and sexuality. One thing that's interesting about the way in which the show layers its Jewishness with the constant attention to the queerness of its characters is the parallel between the potential for hiding and thus exposure in both cases. In the show, however, the sexuality of its characters is represented as one key site of anxiety, while any fear or discomfort around Jewishness is relegated to the distant past, to the storyline which traces how Mora's mother Rose escaped Germany but left behind her transgendered sibling Gershom slash Gittel. And yet the twinning of these two themes reproduces the fear surrounding Jewish sexuality, which is itself endemic in the 20th century to the representation of Jews. I think it's fair to say that on this front and others, the show follows in the footsteps of Lenny Bruce and Philip Roth insofar as it seems aimed to make us cringe. But the cringing is different here. We don't cringe because we're offended, but we cringe in recognition of desires and behaviors that are rarely represented so publicly. Interestingly, from my perspective at least, this has less to do with the sexuality or sexual habits of the various characters and more to do with the fact that the characters are so nakedly on screen as flawed, selfish, needy, injured, and injuring humans. At certain points, we can chalk their Jewishness up to, as incidental, but there's also a sense in which the show participates in the tradition of representing Jews as quintessentially human, but somehow more so. At the same time, the show reproduces the phenomenon of the double viewer through references that seem aimed privately at distinctly American Jewish audiences. This is perhaps best exemplified in the opening sequence that varies from episode to episode, but is always made up of what seems to be footage cut from home movies, although it almost always includes shots of a boy voguing in what for some of us is recognizable as a suburban American early 1990s bar mitzvah. The footage seems at one and the same time to be fundamentally private and universal, but it includes references to rituals that one would either need to be Jewish or to have been significantly exposed to Jewish culture to get. It was in its last season when the Pfeffermans go to Israel that their American Jewishness, at least from my perspective, is both most cringeworthy and most recognizable. Again, the opening credits themselves are worth watching for this reason. I was particularly struck by the scene of the inside of the tour bus. There's the, the one, okay. Uh, sorry, where am I? A ubiquitous reality for most American Jews visiting Israel for the first time, and yet I would guess unrecognizable to others. But the cringeworthy element comes from the way the Pfeffermans perform a naive romanticization of the state of Israel. Mora kisses the ground and then gets knocked over in the airport. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, um, and with the exception of Ali, who seems prone to romanticism on the other side, resist having their preconceptions overturned, even when faced with stark realities. <coughs> what it does particularly well, however, and this is worth saying here, though perhaps off topic, is to represent the way our political opinions and positions are so deeply infused with, the, with and by the most personal of our desires. I found myself thinking at the end of the final Israel episode that the show had done a better job of revealing the complexities around the American-Jewish relationship to Israel than almost any <coughs> book, article, or op-ed I'd read on the topic, if only because reason in the show is always subordinated to desire, fear, anxiety, and basic human need. This doesn't mean that one always sympathizes with the Pfeffermans, Critics sometimes describe the characters as uniquely unlikable in their selfishness and pettiness, but the honesty and emotional nudity of the show is at least in my experience unparalleled. So I have another page and a half where I talk about the Gilmore Girls, and I'll just summarize it to say that I think that Amy Sheridan Palladino does the opposite with the Gilmore Girls, where she sort of sets up all these situations in which you're supposed to cringe, but then it becomes so glossy and perfectly wrapped up. And in fact, you're spared the experience of cringing, and yet the trope of the Jew being the one who exposes everything, of course, is performed by Midge, particularly as she actually takes her nightgown off um, at the gaslight. Um, and so it's playing on this idea that she's in the tradition of Lenny Bruce, but then what we get as viewers is completely devoid of any of that experience. And so we actually feel sort of comforted and at ease as a consequence. So let me just finish in conclusion and say the contrast between Transparent and The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, both of which have now won multiple Emmys, is striking. But they share in common 
But what they share in common nonetheless is not only that, the play, that they play with Jewish stereotypes, but the way in which they reference a whole history of American representations of Jews in Judaism. And in so doing, even in an era in which the role of the Jew in American culture has been superseded by any number of ethnic and religious replacements, maintains its currency, if only by way of repeating a tradition. So are these new shows good for the Jews? It seems an inevitable question to ask. What strikes me most about the current critical response to these new shows is the fact that, as far as I can tell, nobody's actually asking it. And yet the number of panels and articles on transparent and Judaism, surely soon to be replicated by panels and articles on the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, um, especially now that it's achieved critical acclaim, suggests to me that most Jews just feel kind of relieved that anyone still wants to talk about them. Mm -hmm. All right, good afternoon. Oh, come on. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I, too, am very pleased to be with you all this uh, afternoon. And thanks so much for um, the invitation to come and for being such hospitable guests and participants. Um, I thought that I would move in the short time that I have in kind of three ways. The first is just to give you a little bit of insight um, and overview in terms of my work broadly. Um, to then think about um, some of the kind of theoretical frameworks that are, that are underpinning that work and then to actually talk a little bit about uh, some of the forms that I've been most drawn to. So um, at the heart of my work is a concern with black women's experiences. Um, and critical to that work is, you know, unearthing questions about how African American women respond to processes of cultural commodification. So to get at that, I'm guided by three questions. Um, how are black women's religious uh, experiences practiced? How are those practices represented? Um, and what are the implications of those representations? As I've explored these questions, there are three um, discoveries that have, have worked hand in hand with them. The first is that students, like many of us, are particularly drawn to visual, visual representations of black women. Um, the second is that those same visual representations tend to obscure the dynamic religious experiences of black women. And a third discovery is that in many cases, and I would argue in fact most cases, uh, viewers are drawing from a limited toolkit in which to understand and interpret uh, those representations. So in my efforts to construct you know, conversation for my own questions and these points of discovery, um, that's in, in terms of my, my scholarship, my teaching, and now my own kind of professional foray into creating films. Um, I analyze how religion influences how black women's bodies are read, right? Anthony was talking about this um, in his remarks. Within forms like popular film, but also the creative responses within black communities and within black feminist and womanist scholarship that offer us another way of interpreting. Um, and I would offer some nuance uh, in terms of how to interpret these these depictions. Uh, so one example of that is uh, a co-edited co -edited volume that I um, published in 2014, uh, Womanist and Black Feminist Responses to Tyler Perry's Productions, um, <laughs> which you know, takes up the concern that Tyler Perry has monopolized in many ways uh, the structure, um, the construction, et cetera, of black women's religious narratives and popular culture, and that the stakes of that monopoly are especially high because of the ways that his productions become viewed as the voice uh, for black women. So there are numerous sources, I think, out that examine popular representations of black um, women and the black female body that consider implications of the fat body, for example, um, and that explore the complex relationship between religion, race, and film. Yet I found that contemporary work rarely addresses the complex intersections among race, embodiment, gender, and religion at the same time. Um, it's a void that my work seeks to fill and is the driving force behind um, the work that is cited in my uh, bio, uh, Pushing Weight, Religion, Popular Culture, and the Implications of Image, um, where I look at how black religious women in fat suits worn by black male comedians, uh, Tyler Perry, Eddie Murphy, Martin Lawrence, even though Tyler Perry would say I'm not a comedian. 
That is true. <laughs> um, to show how stereotypes of black women are aided by the performance of religion, um, and hopefully ex expand the discourse around portrayals of black women in popular media. So to do that work, I'm developing, in essence, a critical theory of the black female body in religious practice that simultaneously emerges from film theory and the voices of viewers who consume them. Right. Um, and to do that, there are two conceptual frameworks that are guiding this work. Um, this theory that I speak of is explicitly informed, again, by the day-to-day -day lived experiences um, of black women, but it's also informed by this first um, you know, kind of critical framework that I call, um, and it's not my wording, um, the paradox of silence and display. Um, this is the idea that black bodies are constantly uh, negotiating a type of invisibility on the one hand, where any emphasis on the body is muted, downplayed, or ignored, and a type of extreme visibility on the other hand, where the black body is displayed in such a way that it receives exclusive and arguably predominant emphasis. This is a waffling uh, between uh, taciturnity and objectification that you know Dorothy Roberts, um, you know, who coined this phrase, you know, captures quite beautifully. The paradox is due in large part to histories of reading the black body as other, uh, to contemporary representations of black bodies in popular culture. And I would argue has lasting impact on the ways that black bodies are engaged and how black women's religious bodies are also engaged. Um, this paradox is especially uh, complicated for black folks. Uh, within the religion, uh, religions of the African diaspora, the body plays a particular role um, to the lived adherence of faith, um, where the literal enactment and expression of belief is encountered, is mediated, is enacted, it's through the body. Um, relatedly, black folks struggle, like so many religious groups and religious traditions, with very deep contradictions, where the body is an important location in which to encounter the divine and the sacred, but, corporal reality is diminished in order to make appropriate room for that same sacred and divine. Uh, it leads to what I like to think of as a kind of sacred form of double consciousness, right? Um, and it can't be underestimated because it's tied to the second conceptual framework um, that I've been spending a lot of time with and that guides my work. Um, and that is related to the complex relationship between body fictions and the fictional devil. Um, black women face particular challenges when their externally defined identities, especially their religious identities, I would argue, and representations as bodies, those are body fictions, speak louder than what they know to be their experiences. Um, this collision exists between real bodies and an unfriendly informant, a fictional double, uh, whose aim is to mask individuality and mute the voice of personal agency. The relationship between body fictions and the fictional double is especially complicated because it creates a visual vacuum, right, in which black women are not interpreted as individuals, where exposure to experiential examples are limited, and where opportunities to see oneself represented in the broadest way possible, is, they're all too few. So taken together, the, you know, the paradox of silence display body fictions and the fictional double means that black women are literally fighting at every visual turn <laughs> to avoid being turned into or interpreted as a stereotype uh, and to see and find genuine, real representations of themselves and what they see, what we see, uh, in popular media forms such as film and television. So if I'm painting a bleak picture, it is purposefully so. Um, but it is not a picture that um, is without some hope. I'm going to do something that I rarely do, um, which is to offer in this very public venue uh, a claim that I have yet to fully substantiate. <laughs> um, I have a pretty strong hunch, though, and I'd like to spend the, the time that I have left talking about this. If there's any argument to be made, it is this. Um, and I think Abigail will be very happy to know this is the argument that I'm making. Um, it is that the medium of documentary um, holds the greatest possibilities for offering positive, holistic, diverse, complex, fully fleshed out representations of black women's religious experiences. Um, certainly all of the mediums that I discuss and I will discuss have their problems, right? Cinematic gaze. <laughs> you know, the gaze they create, how they're funded, how they're distributed, who is making them, who is viewing them. They all have an impact on the meaning that they make. 
And, and I mention that quickly here, not to dismiss those challenges, but to denote the additional layers of complexity they bring to this enterprise of um, analyzing their impact on our contemporary religious literacy, so to speak. Um, and that's especially the case as it relates to black women's religious expression. And yet I still want to make a case for the documentary format, um, but not before I just briefly talk about um, feature films and the television series. So the feature film is notably short, you know, typically under three hours, typically, <laughs> um, fictional and created for purposes of entertainment. Um, it is, I would argue, the least capable of best representing uh, black women's religious experiences. Um, I've already mentioned this, but you know, I have the great fortune or perhaps misfortune of spending a lot of time uh, watching Tyler Perry films. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, and I focus on Tyler Perry in part because of his popularity the sheer quantity of films that he makes, um, and his unique position as a black filmmaker and television producer and director and writer and, and, and right, et cetera, um, who has made nearly a billion dollars <laughs> um, on his various films, who owns his own studio, and whose films are often implicitly and almost always explicitly um, saturated with depictions of black women's religiosity. Um, Tyler Perry's particular representations of black womanhood, like his representations of African American religion, are riddled with inconsistencies, with contradictions, and downright problematic renderings. Um, is Tyler Perry a master showman or a glorified stagehand within a broader symbolic church production? Um, is his gun-toting grandmother Medea figure, is she a mediated kind of conglomerate of historical female tropes? or? an insightful religious critic with an ax to grind against the historic black Protestant church. That's, that's generous. <laughs> um, and can the writer, producer, director, entrepreneur, actor, Tyler Perry adequately depict the complexities of black women's experiences and spiritual identities? And even if he could, should he? Um, thinking about these questions makes the insertion of Tyler Perry, who adeptly offers his own interpretations of black womanhood, uh, black women's sexuality and black female spirituality, especially intriguing. Uh, one of the masterful effects of a Tyler Perry production, especially film, uh, is that they articulate exactly what and who the modern good black woman should be, even if she's angry. So this image that uh, I have before you is from his most recent release that came out in March called Acrimony. Okay, we all know what the word acrimony means. Look at the way that Taraji P. Henson, who's an Emmy um, Award recipient, who's been nominated for an Academy Award, um, you know, she, didn't, she looks none too pleased. So without knowing anything about this movie, you can guess what's going to happen. <laughs> She's going to be pissed off, and it is true, <laughs> through the entire film, um, and you know, spends a lot of time in, in a murderous kind of rage um, against uh, a partner who hasn't, in, by all accounts, done her wrong, um, but also the kind of manifestation of the stereotypes of the angry black woman and how that perpetuates. I mean, there, there are all kinds of ways of thinking about um, Tyler, Tyler Perry, and this is just one of loads of examples. <laughs> um, <laughs> I look more favorably, um, admittedly, these days upon, among, um, upon the medium of television, um, and especially the extended series format, um, and I believe it surpasses film for the possibilities it offers in representing black women, their experiences, their bodies, their epistemologies, and their beliefs. Um, take, for example, the series Queen Sugar. Um, are people familiar with yeah. Queen Sugar? Um, it is produced and uh, directed by Ava DuVernay, um, and Oprah Winfrey serves as the executive producer and distributes the show on OWN Network. I cannot say enough about how amazingly beautiful uh, this show is. Uh, it follows the Board Alone siblings, Ralph Angel, who's played by uh, Kofi Sirbo, uh, Nova, Rutina Wesley, who's in the center of the screen, uh, and Charlie, Dawn Lyon Gardner, as they grapple with losing their father, um, who bequeathed a failing 800-acre sugarcane farm to them. Right? So the siblings' relationships are nuanced, they're evolving, they're estranged. Um, it's captured in ways that any of us who have family <laughs> immediately resonate um, with. This still that I um, have before you depicts one of the most powerful scenes in the first season. We witness the family both come apart while coming together. Um, and it's something, it is something really profound to witness. Not only do we get a beautifully kind of shot scene with three siblings who with very different lives and very different viewpoints coming together to bury their father, we also get to see sacred rituals of African-American religion laid bare. 
So Christian writes, yes, but key to this scene is that the Prince Hall Freemasons are offering their last rites over Ernest's body. Nova, who is uh, played by Rutina Wesley, so if you're a True Blood fan, uh, she was um, Tara on that show, right? Um, she is truly the center of, the spiritual center of this family, right? So she's an activist and she's a writer, um, but she's also a folk healer. She uses local natural herbs and remedies to heal broken black bodies. Um, she is the spiritual glue, I can't emphasize that enough, to hold that holds the family together, and a conjure woman, no less, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's powerful to behold such beautiful blackness and black religious um, diversity represented on the screen. Um, that power is something that should not be taken lightly. In an interview with the Huffington Post, um, Rutina Wesley literally teared up when asked about what playing the role of Nova um, meant to her. She not only described the importance of representation on the screen, of seeing oneself, but she also noted, and I quote here, getting the chance to pay a beautiful, gorgeous black woman with dreads who's smart, funny, witty, chaotic, she's everything. It's a brown girl's dream because she's a real human being. Mm -hmm. To be fully fleshed out, this is uh, Rutina Wesley's phrase, mm -hmm. um, a proud black woman makes her portrayal of Nova so special. Um, and that this show is produced and directed by Ava DuVernay and has had every single episode directed by a woman says something about the power of the narratives that they can create. Um, and lastly, the documentary format. So the scripted television series, um, like the scripted television series, um, documentary formats have the ability of telling stories over time, right? One of the fundamental difference, though, is that they are designed with the intent of showing aspects of real life. Um, it is a most powerful, I think, medium because of that reality and because it allows women to tell their own stories in their own words. It's a powerful thing to choose how to represent yourself and to base that representation on how you see yourself to be rather than the fictional double or the bodily fiction that someone would place upon you. Um, one great example is uh, Being Serena, which has largely flown under the radar. There hasn't been a whole lot of commentary on it, um, which is a five-part documentary series on Serena Williams, who is arguably the greatest athlete of all time. Just saying. <laughs> Just saying. Um, she's allowing us, in her own words, in her own way, access to her life, a life that we have no right to, um, but that she's chosen to share with us. So in a scathing critique of the, docu, uh, the docuseries, Slate writer Christina uh, Cattarucci characterizes uh, being Serena as, quote, surprisingly lacking in humanity, end quote. Um, what she attributes a part, she attributes in part to Wilt Williams' kind of stilted narration. She's like, oh, it's like she's narrating a Nike commercial, right? That's the analogy that uh, she uses. But in large part, she took issue with it because she found the narrative in the docuseries to be too guarded. So her claim about William's seeming guardedness speaks right to the heart of religious illiteracy. And an, an important fact that we cannot ignore is that Serena Williams is a practicing Jehovah's Witness. Mm -hmm. To bring unnecessary attention to herself and her life outside of the sport is its own murky territory for her to navigate within her faith, right? That's something that she's talked about in numerous interviews um, over the years. So I would like to make a case that regardless of what writers, reporters, producers, consumers might think, Serena Williams has every right to depict and portray herself exactly the way that she wants, even if and perhaps especially because we might not understand it. Um, there is something mighty powerful about telling one's own stories in our own words and in our own way. And documentaries give us the opportunity to do just that. After all, the desire to be fully fleshed out, to have all that we see, all that we experience, all that we love, all that we know, all that we believe, be visualized in a way that we know ourselves to be is essential to being truly seen and understood. And outside of that is merely a bodily fiction or a fictional double. It augments the paradox of silence and display. Um, lastly, I would just say that regardless of the limitations that desire might yield, Having someone else render our representations is a much less appealing alternative. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna take, what, here's a suggestion. Let's maybe if we could ask, uh, I call on three people to all ask your questions and then we'll have the panelists decide 
which ones or if there are themes so that we can try to hear from a lot of people. So let's, great. Um, hi, first off, thank you all for really, really powerful presentations. Um, I wanted to ask Sarah if, uh, if you happen to have seen Disobedience um, this year. Um, okay. Well, Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was just, uh, or if anyone else has, in terms of um, the portrayal of queerness and religion in an Orthodox Jewish community, and um, well, I'd be curious to know your thoughts. And yeah, <laughs> next year. Questioned out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were that engaged. <laughs> or or hu hungry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. That's the other. Any other? Yeah, there's one. This question is for Ron. Um, do you think that new media, like particular, I'm thinking about like YouTube in particular and that very self- uh, it, its ability to allow for self-representation, how that might compare with, with documentary. And I'm thinking specifically of folks like Dina Tokyo, who's a really, really well-known um, hijabi fashion blogger, um, and also in the US, uh, Mona Hadir, who's a rapper and an activist, um, and how those women are using YouTube in particular. Yeah, um, I do. And I mean, a, another great example of that is um, Issa Rae and how she had the, you know, the mm -hmm. awkward black girl, the adventures of awkward black girl, and then that, you know, eventually morphed into what is now insecure. I mean, the 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 beauty I think of those new media is just that. Again, you know, it's mediated and you know, essentially designed, created, and potentially distributed by the person who's making it. I do think that makes a big difference for voice. I think that makes a big difference for. Um, you know, questions of uh, authenticity, right? Um, you know, so much of that is still kind of manufactured, right? If you think about if you're on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook that we, you know, um, present ourselves in certain ways. So there's still some of that for sure, and it doesn't completely eliminate um, questions of authenticity for sure, but I do think it's a pretty powerful platform. I would also argue that it has the advantage, it came, the question, um, and in fact, it was your question earlier, and it was one of the, the notes that I had to myself about access. Um, you know, because a lot of the, the shows that I'm mentioning, you know, you have to have cable or Hulu or et cetera. And those subscriptions, subscriptions are nominal compared to what they used to be. Um, but if you want to get them all, you got to get HBO plus Hulu plus, the, you know, so it's like essentially you have cable all over again. Um, but I do think that that medium is especially powerful because you're able to upload it and disseminate it and, you know, by word of mouth, get it out in, in that format too, so. I think, um, thank you so much to the, all the panelists. Uh, the question I have for any one of you, but especially because you, you focus so much on, on women um, and, and the representation in, in religion, is that religion itself all over the world is so patriarchal. So my question to you is, I mean, you've explored other themes in relation to the intersection of body and it's, you know, how it's represented. You've spoken about celebrities and how pieces of their life that relate to religion may, may not have been presented. But what about within faith itself? Where, what about women in faith? Like their lives, has, has it been explored enough? Is this a place that can break through where there has been silence? Because I don't know anything about much, except within my own faith, mm. about that lived experience of women who are in faith and who experience this silence in relation to their own faith. Um, I, if I could just say very quickly, man, if there was a question that if I had planted someone in the audience, <laughs> 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 that I'd be like, yes, this is a question for me, <laughs> it would be just that. Um, I, there are a couple of things that I would just say very quickly and then for sure defer to others on the, um, the panel here. So my work initially, I, I began and I continue to be an ethnographer, 
right? So my first book was on the lived religious experiences of seven women in the South Carolina Low Country. Um, I went on another path because Tyler Perry forced me to, in terms of the frequency of his production, to to engage um, what he's doing in popular film. But this is what the work that I'm doing in Pushing Weight exactly is. It's actually talking to the people who are experiencing on the ground, um, you know, not only the representations that they see, but it's engaging consumers in that way, right? And so already the preliminary research that I've done has yielded some pretty fascinating results, right? One of those results is that um, black women are at least black church-going women in the Atlanta area. I mean, that's the area that I've been focusing in because that's the home of Tyler Perry Studios where a lot of these films get um, disseminated and all kinds of red carpet things and et cetera. So, um, is that they're willing to suspend some of the more problematic imagery um, because it's so valuable to be able to see themselves or someone like them on the screen, right? Um, even as they might not necessarily recognize or agree with the ways that they, black women, black women's bodies, and especially black religion is being depicted. So there's an interesting kind of suspense, right? A suspending of, um, of various ways to be critical, but it, it is not to say that they are unaware, right, um, of, of how those things have happened. So that's a kind of layered, very short answer to what I've been trying to do, but that's why I've been trying to put them in conversation. I suppose in, in a dreamland I would maybe do some kind of documentary that would respond <laughs> in this exact way to those representations. You heard it here first. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for that question. Anyone else want to respond to that? Um, I, I would just say, do I need to use the mic? Yeah. Okay. I would just say that in terms of you know Muslim women and the portrayals in especially in entertainment and the media, um, as generally they've been used as a tool to show how barbaric the cultures are. Look how oppressed the women are. You know they're 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 undercover. They have to scurry around. Rarely do you ever see um, any portrayal, unless you're looking at like Little Mosque on the Prairie, or you know, and those are not big mainstream productions. So I would say, just in terms of Muslim women, they're like either invisible or they're a tool to show the barbarism. Do I have a solution? No, but that's what I see. Yes. I think um, I think we're gonna. We're going to go ahead and um, wrap this up. We, we're um, we're going to stay on schedule, so you have three minutes for lunch. <laughs> um, what? How much time do we have for lunch? Uh, about thirty minutes. We can come back at one forty. So we're we're going to uh, ask you to come back. We're going to ask this <laughs> whether you do it or not. As uh, ask you to come back by one forty. But uh, before we close, let's please give a round of applause for. Some.